Today we continue financial management 13. Chapter is five, six interest rates. Chapter six interest rates. And now we are to six two. And six two is interest rate levels. Interest rate levels, we can talk about real interest rates and nominal interest rates. Uh, levels vary. Sometimes they go down as 1% or half percent on the short term. Right now, interest rates are as low as 2% on the long term. And interest rates can, rock, can rise as much as 15% or 20%. When interest rates go down, this means that it's cheaper and easier to borrow, and this is stimulating the economy. When interest rates rise, most businesses and governments which are in debt go bankrupt. That's usually the way it goes. It goes into bankruptcy. So, in order to make it easy for businesses, central banks usually have a policy which keeps interest rates artificially low and artificially suppressed. When they keep interest rates artificially low, they generate artificial booms in the economy, and as inflation heats up and interest rates eventually rise to match inflation, they all go bankrupt. That's the short, sweet story of our global financial crisis these days. And there's not too much to teach on this section. We go to 6.3, something that I mentioned last time, determinants. Of interest rates. And we have what we discussed last time is called quoted interest rate. I am right now on page 156. Uh, 156, quoted interest rate, that will be equation 6.1. And quoted interest rate, it is what we usually refer as nominal interest rate. And with equation 6-1, it has what we call a number of components. The first one is R star, which is the real risk-free interest rate. Textbook uses IP, standing for inflation premium, inflation premium. And inflation premium is simply compensation for the loss of purchasing power. Compensation for the loss of purchasing power. Therefore, we very often call it purchasing power premium. So inflation equals purchasing power. Okay, the next piece is 
DRP R P and is a default risk premium. So It is very simple. Compensation for default risk. That's all there is to it. So you got inflation risk and therefore have compensation for inflation. You got default risk, compensation for default. Next one is LP <coughs> plus and stands for liquidity premium and it's simply premium simply means compensation or price so premium is simply compensation or price for risk. So liquidity premium is simply compensation for liquidity risk. Default premium or default risk premium is premium for default risk. Inflation premium is simply premium for inflation risk or we also call it purchasing power risk. So the rule is simple for every single risk there is a premium or compensation for that particular risk so what we are outlining here is basically we're outlining the various risks doesn't mean these are all the risks it means these are the big these are the major the most important risks and they got this thing called MRP P standing for maturity <laughs> risk premium but it's simply compensation for maturity risk now, in other words, compensation for the fact that you have to hold a longer term security. Well, let's write this out a little bit. What we covered a long time ago is that maturity, the longer the maturity, the higher the price changes or the higher the price volatility. So, when maturity of a bond, we call it fixed income instrument, increases, it immediately follows that volatility increases. In other words, longer maturity, securities with longer maturities have higher volatility. But rising volatility means necessarily higher risk. Sometimes this particular risk, and I'll write it actually in red, they call price risk. price risk. The risk that prices will go up and down, which is different from the risk that they aren't going to pay at all, which is different from the risk that when you want to sell it, you can't 
really sell it because of market or other conditions, okay? So this is called a price risk, but sometimes it is known as, and they just call it volatility risk. But here, they seem to like to call it maturity risk. So I'll just write all three, maturity. Risk. Basically, the risk that rises with increasing maturity, okay? So, now basically what section 6.3 does is simply goes through each of these components. All right, so the first component, R star, is the real, real, let me see what I'm going to use here, the blue one, R star. Real risk free interest rate. Well, basically, this is the rate of return which investors require to be compensated for time. Time. So, this is compensation for time in the most popular way of saying it this is the requirement that in uh, that consumers require to be compensated for not consuming today but instead consuming a year from now it is human nature and humans simply want to consume as fast as possible on the simple question do you want an iPhone today or three months from today human nature says yes I want it today do you want a brand new laptop today or a year from today and the answer is of course today people are not willing to postpone consumption it's just who humans are that they want to have whatever they want to have as soon as possible okay you want to have the car today the house today the phone the camera whatever you like you want to have it today so this is compensation for time the mere fact that you're not going to be consuming today but three months from today or a year from today and that's the real risk-free interest rate and the real part refers to the fact that we're talking basically in terms of consumption in terms of commodities you can have one kilogram today of let's say rice or can wait for a year and get 1.1 kilograms of rice and the extra 0.1 kilograms of rice is 10 percent is your real compensation compensation in terms of real consumption well why would people want to postpone that well the answer is in seven years you could get two kilograms of basically rice same thing for iPhones or cameras or mobiles or anything else you might want to not buy today and within seven years you're going to have Two, okay some people might want to do that so some people prefer to consume others prefer to wait out and get more in the future more rice more wheat more corn more cameras more mobiles more everything and this is in terms of goods and services and risk free indicates that there is no risk to return sometimes they call it and write this whole thing as
risk-free interest rate. Risk-free interest rate. And this is real risk-free interest rate. And when you take R star plus inflation, you get, this is what Bear was asking last time, nominal risk-free interest rate. Nominal. Risk-free interest rate. So, nominal risk-free interest rate is real risk-free interest rate plus inflation, okay? So, what we like to say is that this R star is compensation for time, this IP is compensation for inflation, and this represents real, the two jointly represents nominal, and these represents risk premia. In other words, these are different types of risk premiums, each premium for each type of risk, okay? And you have real risk-free interest rate, nominal uh, risk-free interest rate. Let's see what else we have. When we say nominal, I'm repeating what I already wrote. The textbook, uh, blue cover, likes to call it, here quoted. Quoted risk free interest rate. Why quoted? They use the word quoted because you go to the bank to borrow money and they say 7%. This is the interest rate that the bank will quote to you. They'll say you can borrow at 7%. Well, 7% quoted is the same as 7% nominal. When you're buying bonds and they tell a bonds yield 5%, what they mean is nominal interest rate of 5%. We'll call it nominal yield, okay? Let's see what else we have here in this section. Therefore, they sometimes use the term risk-free rate. And risk-free rate, you should understand, is for me, for you, for anybody in the world, extremely confusing because it's not clear if it's real or nominal. And therefore, you should simply avoid using it, okay? You should try to avoid just using interest rate and risk-free interest rate because it's not clear. Do you mean real? Do you mean nominal? As I'm teaching on a particular one, it's clear from the context. But in general, you have to be always careful to tell the difference between the one or the other. Now, inflation premium, the question now gets, so basically what I'm doing is explaining each one of these step by step. Now, the inflation premium, the question is, what determines inflation premium? And the short, correct answer is expected inflation. Let me write it in red. It's an important term in economics and finance. And here is now the next key. When we say expected inflation, uh, 
do we may expect an inflation over the next week or today or expected inflation tomorrow or next month or next year or the next 10 years and the correct answer is the expected inflation over the maturity of the security so for a two-year bond you or we mean expected inflation over the next two years for a one year note it is expected inflation over one year for a 10 year bond expected inflation over 10 years okay for a three month treasury uh, you have over the next three months so expected inflation is always over the maturity of the security okay and for that reason this expected inflation could be possibly rising and falling with maturity so you cannot think that in expected inflation is always the same that for one year security is the same as for five years is the same for ten years you can't do that you may be having an expectation let's say of recession and sometimes during recessions you may actually have falling inflation for other reasons and as the economy tips into a recession you may be actually expecting within the next one two three years much lower interest rates than interest rates are now okay so basically inflation expectations change over time they change with the dynamics of the economy and for that simple reason there is no way around understanding bonds understanding fixed income securities unless you understand inflation inflation is the one key risk to understanding the other key risk i've already mentioned it 10 times is risk so everything focuses on inflation and on risk okay over the securities life this is page 150 158 all right next one is default risk premium is simply the risk of default premium for the risk of default that's on page 160 we've already done this we've already covered it before default simply means inability to pay the amount due on time and in full that's default and we already discussed before liquidity is inability to sell at market price when you need it and its inability to sell it quickly so let's write out the key characteristics for liquidity the first key characteristic of liquidity is market price if it's liquid you can sell it close to market price Uh, the best examples you can have is very illiquid will be cars used cars even new cars are extremely difficult to sell for a standard or regular market price you just have to wait for weeks or months oh wait for weeks or months so the second one is time is in search time the time that it takes to find a buyer for the asset now liquidity let's clarify applies to assets to all assets to any asset it applies equally to stocks just as well as bonds as well as 
occurrences, as well as real estate, as well as commodities, including personal items. Here is extremely illiquid item. My shirt. How likely I'm going to sell my shirt? I mean, who's going to buy my shirt? I mean, they don't, nobody wants to buy a used shirt, someone that's been worn for weeks or months, right? <laughs> you just can't buy. Now, I can't get market price, that's for sure. Can I get half price? No way. I mean, who's going to be dumb enough to buy my shirt for half price? Am I going to get a quarter of a price? No way. I mean, then I can get one, two, or three percent. I mean, if this is worth, let's say, 200, if I can get sell it for two, I'd be lucky, right? I mean, no one's going to buy it at all. So, you see, some assets are extremely, extremely, extremely illiquid. And these are assets which are highly personal. So, if they are very personal, they're extremely illiquid. Another example, very personal item that's kind of like made for you will be your glasses. I mean, how much you can sell your glasses to the next guy? For like nothing. Why? <laughs> you can't use them. I mean, the, the prescription is different, the size is different, you know, the diopters is different, the frame is different, and you might not like your style. So, the more personal the item is, the harder it is to sell. Now, on the other hand, the more universal it is, we call this characteristic fungible. Fungible. The more universal, universal meaning fungible, meaning the more easy to, it is to substitute one unit for another, the more liquid the asset is likely to be. Example of fungible goods will be one liter of bottled water from another liter of bottled water, both of them drinking pure and all the other things. Uh, one liter of gasoline that you drive for your motorcycle, scooter, and from another liter of gasoline. I mean, do you care which gasoline you're going to get, this liter or that liter? No. Right? It's all the same. Uh, so, uh, electricity, one kilowatt of electricity, another kilowatt of electricity. So, the more personal it is, the less liquid. The alternative is fungible, meaning homogeneous, easy to substitute one for another. Example will be in the classroom, the chairs. I mean, you can easily substitute one chair for another, no big deal, right? You can easily substitute one table for another. Tables are fairly fungible here in the classroom, okay? So all of these tell you what the liquidity uh, is. All right, so liquidity depends on how easy it is to substitute one unit for another. And the second key to liquidity is how universal the demand is. So, what will be example of something with universal demand? Well, gasoline. Highly universal demand. People just want to know all over the world. Another uh, highly universal demand is rice. I mean, you should know how easy it is to sell rice, okay? So, many, many different foods are highly fungible, okay? Rice, wheat, cotton, uh, many other like metals are highly fungible. Kilogram of copper could easily substitute with any other kilogram of copper, okay? Uh, example which is not fungible is watches, okay? Uh, my watch is totally different from yours. Watch is very, very, very personal thing, okay? So watches don't easily sell, they're actually very illiquid. So this explains basic causes and reasons for liquidity. Number one is fungible, how easy it is to exchange. And the other one is what we like to call in finance and economics, marketability, marketable. Marketable simply means how 
strong demand is do a lot of people demand it or few people demand it water easy to sell in strong demand okay uh, coffee tea very easy to sell very very marketable okay so things that are in universal demand are usually more and more and these are the two primary characteristics of fungibility and marketability are the two primary characteristics that determine liquidity of assets including liquidities of stocks, bonds, and so on. All right, and let's see, interest rate. Yeah, they get this thing called interest rate risk. That gets real price risk, volatility risk. Now we got, it's very confusing. Interest rate risk. Interest rate risk is simply the risk the price changes with changes in interest rates. So interest rate risk, of course, relates to price risk. So interest rate risk is the same as price risk, becomes the same as volatility risk. And here is the other key. It increases with maturity. So as maturity increases, interest rate risk increases. Let me explain. When interest rates rise by 1%, a two-year bond is going to fall twice more than a one-year bond. And a five-year bond is going to fall five times more than a one-year bond. So the longer the maturity, the longer the interest rate risk. And interest rate risk depends on the maturity, and it depends on well, it determines with vol uh, determines volatility and price risk. So this is interest rate risk, and when you have interest rate risk, they call. Now I'm going on page 161, page 61 uh, on the first paragraph that uh, you have maturity risk. Premium is the compensation for interest rate risk, which is the same as you'd like to call it maturity risk over here. Okay, so the problem with this is that it is very confusing. The problem is that Different people, meaning different investors, different analysts, use different words in different terms. And for a new person, it could be very confusing. You need to understand the concept, and then you need to understand each particular term for that concept. Okay? So these are all pretty much the same risk. Oh, but we already started. There is one other type of risk, which is not here in the formula. Let's write it out. Reinvestments. Pop this up because it's reinvestment risk. Which we've already covered a few times. The risk that when you get the proceeds, meaning when your security matures and you try to reinvest, you will not be able to get a similar or the same return. So interest rates are now 7%. You're getting a 7% return when it matures a year from now because you say, well, I just want to have it for a year. So what you are trading off, what's called a trade-off, is you're trading off maturity risk for reinvestment risk. Let's write it out. Reinvestment risk and let's write this out. Maturity risk. What does it mean? It means that as maturity 
goes down, when maturity goes down, and maturity risk goes down, it means that you have to reinvest sooner and reinvestment risk goes up. So, the only way to lower your reinvestment risk is to increase your maturity risk. And the opposite. If you want to lower your maturity risk, you got to increase your reinvestment risk. So, it's important to understand that there is no avoiding risk. Risk is always there. Hurricanes always come and the risk is there, okay? There's the risk of possible revolution. I'm not saying here and now in this country. I'm saying in general. There's the risk of potential instability. There is the risk of nuclear accidents like we had one in Japan, okay, recently. Of natural disasters, earthquakes, hurricanes. There is a risk of what we call, and we discuss in the other class, financial contagion. Terrible things happen in America and suddenly hits Europe down the road. And if America and Europe go down, before you know it, China's in trouble or Japan's in trouble, okay? And if China and Japan's in trouble, soon enough, maybe within a couple of days, Taiwan's gonna be in trouble. Maybe in modern electronics with iPhones and Blackberries, maybe only hours later. So, there is no avoiding risk. You can transform one risk into another risk. You can lower one risk, but you gotta increase a different risk, but risk, is always there and when we say that government securities have no risk or risk free I've explained this many times it is totally and completely wrong it is absolutely wrong it's also sometimes propaganda sometimes uh, incompetence to say that oh government securities are risk free no government securities are usually default free when they are denominated in your own currency because the government can print and actually later sell it. Uh, let's look back. Government securities are always quoted in nominal terms and there is inflation risk. You have for any government bond inflation risk no matter what, can you please close that door because it's too noisy? You always have inflation risk that all government securities are subject. Even if you have treasury, inflation protected securities, you are subject to, they say, oh, you're completely protected from risk. No, wrong. You're not completely protected from risk. The risk is that the government will under report inflation. In these securities, the government pays you the real rate and then it separately pays you inflation. And if inflation is reported 4%, they gotta pay 4. And if inflation is reported 2%, they gotta pay 2%. Now, you're the government and you're in financial trouble. Are you going to report 4 and pay 4 and bankrupt yourself or you'd rather report 2%? And the answer is, the government will always be inclined to report a lower inflation in order to pay lower. So, you got a calculation risk or inflation reporting risk. So, just because it's inflation protected does not mean there is no inflation risk. You introduce a bunch of other risks. Similarly, as investors in Greek bonds discovered Greek bonds are subject to liquidity risk. You try to sell a Greek bond, you're in trouble, crisis, bankrupt. Just recently, two weeks ago, Italy tried to sell a bunch of bonds and they simply couldn't. They came to the point where the market for Italian bonds froze. There is no single buyer. Everybody tried to sell, no buyer. So, you have government bonds and the government bond market 
freezes completely. Of course, it's frozen. Why? Because everybody calculates extremely high default risk and they're not willing to take the default risk, so default risk converts or transforms into liquidity risk, okay? And you have, what is this MRP standing for? I'm trying to find maturity risk. Basically, again, maturity risk, you have also maturity risk with securities. You always have those. One year is different from two, different from five. You always have volatility. These risks are always there. So, it is extremely important to understand that government securities are not risk-free. Yes, they may be possibly the, uh, uh, free from default risk if, like the British government, can print its own money to pay for the bonds, or the American government can print its own money to pay for it, or the Japanese government can print to pay, but Italians can't print euro to pay. Euro is uh, usually controlled by the ECB, not by any particular government. Okay? So, European countries, because they have a joint lead, they have euro currency and they cannot issue in their own currency on top of all the other risks they have even the default risk so they are not risk free at all okay is this good enough all right